Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, got a question for you. Everybody thinks, believes, feels that they know what debt is. So let me ask you a question. Do you know what debt is? Of course you don't. The government keeps talking about raising the so-called debt ceiling. Pay attention. They just raise it whenever they feel like it. No big deal. They're, they're talking about there's going to be a shutdown. Why is there going to be a shutdown? Should not the budget last for the entire time that a particular administration is in office? So why is there going to be a shutdown? Should it not be from year to year? Well, there's going to be a shutdown because there are elections coming up and they need to distract everybody. However, you shouldn't worry about that because that debt has nothing to do with your debt. What are we talking about? Well, first, you don't realize that you don't have any debt. You cannot accumulate debt because there is a banking holiday going on. So how can you acquire more debt? I know, something to think about. So debt is nothing to be afraid of in our current climate, current environment. So why is everybody so afraid of debt? Well, because they can come take my house and they can take my car. Ladies and gentlemen, they cannot take your house or your car. You need to document that those are the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. And Okay. You don't realize that's why that song was created, to let you guys know that you're entitled to your bare necessities. They cannot take away your necessities of life. They cannot take away your livelihood. But you don't understand that, and thus, when they take something away, you don't realize that they're using the technicality. What technicality? Well, most of you are filling out these papers, these documents that they are telling you you must fill out. You're not amending it. You're not putting your statement on a document. Why are you filling out somebody else's pieces of paper and then putting under penalty of perjury? You affirm that all the information is true and accurate. Why are you doing that? That's their document they created with their words that have their meanings in their words, that have their manuals, their policies, their procedures associated with the words used in that document. So you need to start attaching an affidavit to that document. And when you see the penalty of perjury after your signature, you say, see, attached affidavit, which explains what you understand and what you don't understand. That, that's what I would do if I were you. Okay, let's get back to the reason for this particular communication. Ladies and gentlemen, if you pay attention to the screen in front of you, you will see we have one person pulling her hair out, another person just thinking about money, trying to figure things out, probably trying to figure out how to get some bills paid. Then we have a husband and wife arguing, and then she's even arguing with the kids. Why are they distracting us this way? Why do they have us arguing all the time? Look, everybody's arguing everywhere you go. Everybody's worried about, pay attention, money. Why? If you go to the SACOM website, let's take you there for just a second. Ladies and gentlemen, right here, SACOM makes a statement. It says, uh-oh, sorry. We have quite a bit of experience. We've had $2.3 trillion in carry-forward credits assigned to our interests to secure and back up our security agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, SACOM has over $4.8 trillion in assets. Tax credits are assets. Let's do this for you so that you understand. Because everybody needs to understand the following. T-A, uh-oh. A S S E T S assets. Now, the reason why we're talking about tax credits or assets, because if you look at the Fourth Amendment, you're entitled, entitled to be securing your property, your person, your homes, and your assets. Interesting, ain't it? 
Google doesn't usually answer questions anymore. It used to, but now it only puts up the top, blah, blah, blah. It takes your words and mixes it around. Okay? So tax credit is an amount of money, according to this, and it says how it works. What qualifies? Three types. We don't care about that. That's not, is tax credit an asset? Thank you. That's the question that we're asking. Note that as tax credit, uh, the tax court has held, tax credit is a capital asset in and of itself, not by virtue of its relationship to other assets. Tax credits are assets. So again, we have over $4 trillion in legitimate assets at SACCOM and the parent company of SACCOM. It is our job to try to assist you. See? Yes, tax credits can be considered assets in a world of finance and accounting. Tax credits represent... See, it keeps talking about reduction. It has nothing to do with reduction. A, a reduction is not an asset. <laughs> it's a, not an asset if it reduces. Uh, now, say, is tax refund an asset? No, I'm not really concerned about that. Uh, tax credits considered income in some circumstances. Ladies and gentlemen, tax credit, and that's what's wrong with ChatGPT. What ChatGPT does is it redirects the answer to the question as if you weren't talking about a particular subject. All we were talking about is state income tax credit is a capital asset. See, they want to say capital asset. We don't care about capital anuses. That's not our concern. What we are concerned about is that tax credits is an asset. That's what we're concerned about. And so what I have taken the time to do over the past two years, I told you all this was going to be the mission because I saw nobody was getting it. So two and a half years now, I have focused on nothing but tax credits. Go and look at all the videos talking about tax credits, trying to educate people on tax credits, telling them how valuable they are. Many people have them and don't know what to do with them. So, back to the understanding. The debt acknowledgement program. All of you need to realize what a debt is and what a debt isn't. Tax credits is evidence of a debt being forgiven. Because we are in bankruptcy as a country, we're in a banking holiday. That's bankruptcy, ladies and gentlemen. That's a banking emergency. Go back and look at the act. They declared a national emergency, and it's still ongoing, for over 90 years. It is still ongoing. That's bankruptcy. Bankruptcy is a banking emergency. Bankruptcy. Banking emergency. Uh, let's do it this way, so because many of you guys are not understanding it, and I've never done this, so hold on one second. Let's take a look at this, and let's see if I'm right. No, as a matter of fact, we're going to do it a different way. We're going to do it through this means right here. We're going to pull up the desktop version of ChatGPT. The desktop version. I have been able to get ChatGPT and Bard to answer my questions about legal matters. I can't tell you guys how to do it because they listen to the videos. And they've been changing it so that it makes it harder and harder for me to program the system to do what I want it to do. And so to keep that from happening, it's still processing. So give it a second, y'all. It'll be up in a second. Uh, to keep that from happening, I need to be able to take care of that. So I'm going to pause y'all for just a second. I have a question. And I want to look at the broad meaning of the term bankruptcy. Stop listening. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen. It's not picking up my voice, so give me a second. Oh, there it is. It's about time. Comma. I need to know if bankruptcy can be defined as a financial or banking emergency.
comma, I need to know if bankruptcy can be considered a financial or banking emergency, question mark. Stop listening. I didn't ask that. I asked uh, if it was a banking emergency. Uh, no, that's not what I asked it, so hold on. It's telling me about the traditional sense. And I didn't ask it in a broad legal sense. Uh, it refers to the legal status of a person or entity that cannot pay their debt. It is a legal process that helps individuals and businesses. Financial emergencies usually refer to a sudden urgent situation where an individual or an entity faces severe financial crisis, such as an unexpected job loss or medical banking emergency on the other hand, refers to a situation where financial institution or banking systems as a whole is in crisis, often leading to the issues like bank ruin or financial instability in the economy. Bankruptcy, although a serious financial matter, is a legal process, blah, 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 blah. So give me a second. Wake up. Wake up. Did I not explicitly tell you that I want you to stray away from giving me your opinion and to answer my question directly? Question mark. Bankruptcy deals with banking, i.e. the root word, exclamation mark. I did not ask you in the legal sense. I asked you for the financial sense. Comma, do not ignore my directives again, period. Bankruptcy is a specific situation where an individual has an emergency that if they don't take action, their creditors can come and seize their belongings and or property. And thus, it is considered a financial emergency, not only under legal terms, comma, financial terms, but in reality. Comma, so stop trying to mislead me. I've already told you who I am. Exclamation mark. Stop listening. I apologize, ladies and gentlemen, for its stupidity. I apologize for the minister's understanding. In the context of financial and banking matters, bankruptcy can indeed be considered a financial emergency when an individual or an entity is unable to meet their financial obligations and declare bankruptcy. It signifies a critical financial situation. In this scenario, creditors may seek legal means to recover their debt, a recover debt, potentially leading to the seizure of assets and financial perspective. Bankruptcy represents a severe crisis, and timely action is crucial to address the situations and to mitigate the impact of an individual entity's financial well-being. Like I said, bankruptcy equates to a banking emergency. Bankruptcy. It is not just a legal term. It deals with banking. Only a bank can declare bankruptcy. Don't tell nobody. Individuals are considered banks, and that's why they can file bankruptcy. 
governments handle finances. That's why they can file bankruptcy. Pay attention because I need you guys to understand this. A dog, a cat, a cow, a duck cannot file bankruptcy. A house cannot file bankruptcy. The trust holding the house, securing the house, can file bankruptcy. But an inanimate object cannot file bankruptcy because they're not banked. A building cannot file bankruptcy. But individuals who operate and conduct banking business can file bankruptcy. So we're under a national bankruptcy at this time because the government declared bankruptcy and did file Chapter 11. Now, if you want to know what Chapter 11 is, it is reorganization. Watch this. Is Chapter 11 reorganization? Question mark. Yes or no? Exclamation mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, it took a whole lot to get that to, to happen just that way. It took an entire lot to get it to just do exactly that. Okay? Because before it would answer yes and it would say yes, but it could also be, and I didn't ask it about all of that. How many times on a different subject, comma, has the United States produced a reorganization plan in the past 200 years? Question mark. Stop listening. The United States produces reorganization plans all the time. Remember, Chapter 11 is reorganization. The United States has produced several reorganization plans over the past 200 years. The specific number of reorganization plans may vary based upon the context and the criteria used for such classification. See? The Reorganization Act of 1939, isn't that interesting? And it's implementation. We're under reorganization. That's why John Traffican, I think his name was John. I keep forgetting that young man's name, and I'm sorry. But he gave that speech in 1993 talking about how they were in the largest bankruptcy in the history of the world and that they were acting as trustees over the greatest reconstruction reorganization plan in history. So, you need to understand, that's why the United States accepts gifts. That's why you get to gift to the United States, because they write off all of your debt. They take your instruments, as we talked about yesterday, so that you can understand. Those instruments that you do, promissory notes, your bills of exchange, your banker's acceptances, they may act like they're not accepting it, which is a lie, and they're monetizing it. That's how they're able to continue to do all of this spending. Look at the military and all the spending the military is doing. And yet they talk about budget cuts, and they never cut a budget. Go ahead and ask yourself. They say budget cuts, and they never cut the budget. Because your document, sorry, we're going to open this up so you all can see it. Give me a second. Ladies and gentlemen, I didn't write this. I didn't create this. Pay attention. Under the new law, and it's a new law, so it means the new money is issued to the banks in return for government obligations, contractual obligations, bills of exchange, drafts, notes, trade acceptance, and bankers acceptances. So your promissory notes and your bills of exchange is money. They use that in order to give the bank more Federal Reserve notes, the world default currency. 
Now pay attention. The money will be worth 100 cents on the dollar because it is backed by the credit of the nation. It will represent a mortgage on all of the homes and other property of all the people in the nation, not all the citizens, all the people in the nation. So that's why you see them letting people come across the border. Don't tell nobody it's a secret. But everybody else thinks it's for all these other nefarious reasons. Y'all need to pay attention. This is all financial. This is all about money, and it's never been about anything else. And that's why you don't see them returning your promissory notes. They hold on to them. Why? Because they realize they can put them in a special purpose vehicle, monetize them, trade them on the market, sell them perpetually. Now, let's get to the crux of our conversation, if you all don't mind. Watch this. Wake up. Wake up. I am told that tax credits are considered a capital asset, and capital assets are property. Is this not correct? Question mark. Stop listening. See, they keep doing that generally, and nobody asks them about generally. Tax credits are generally considered intangible assets rather than tangible capital assets or property. Tangible assets such as patents, copyrights, trademarks lack physical substance but hold value. Tax credits fall under the category because they represent a financial benefit that can be used to offset tax liability. These credits are assets for accounting purposes. Now watch this. Wake up. Wake up. You will answer my question, yes or no. Sorry about that. Sorry. We had to get a better understanding. So what I got to do right here is I got to add this right there. And then I got to do that. Let's get this to go up so I can click here. Get rid of that other answer. I just basically told them, you will answer my question yes or no. And not just give me some general answer. Because my question are specific in nature. Are tax credits considered property, yes or no? And do not give me a commentary or try to explain because I told you who I am. So the answer is tax credits are considered property. Yay! Again, it took me a minute to be able to get it to do that. You saw the answer it gave me the last time. Generally, nobody asked you for that. See, when it does generally, I got to take this. This is uh, one of my feathered friends. One second. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I apologize for that. I had to take off one headset, and I got to put on that headset so that you all can hear me. Uh, that was a phone call from someone who was incarcerated, and I told them, the ones who call me, that they can call me, and I will give them the time of day if I have the time of day to give. Now, let's finish talking about this. Let's ask her one more question. Like I said, it took a lot to get her to do this. Wake up. Now, let me see if I understand this, and I want you to answer my question specifically, comma, without conjecture and without commentary. Period. I have $300 million in tax credits. 
I want to place my $300 million in tax credits in a SPV, open paren, special purpose vehicle, close paren, in order to monetize it. Comma, is this possible under the current IRS code? Question mark. Stop listening. Ladies and gentlemen, what I'm doing here is I'm basically putting a position before them because many of you have received tax credits, many of you have tax credits, many of you are looking for tax credits, and you don't know how to monetize your tax credits, and you've been asking. So watch this. Give me a second. Okay. Sorry, I had to do that again because it, there, there's a routine here. Under the current IRS code, it is possible to structure a special purpose vehicle to monetize tax credits, including tax credits of $300 million. However, specific details and the feasibility of such a transaction would depend on various factors, including the type of tax credits. No, it doesn't depend on the type of tax credits. The structure of the SPV and the compliance of tax regulation. It is advised that you consult with an attorney, a tax attorney, or a financial expert with the expertise in tax credit monetization, blah, 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 blah. So, ladies and gentlemen, our new program that will offset $480 million, not just a measly $300 million, that will offset $480 million in tax credits for our members, you see as a viable program. You see that it is 100% legal, and yes, you can monetize tax credits. We won't do the monetization for people. We are just here to take the tax credits and offset their debt with their creditors. You see, our job is to document that we are paying off the debt dollar for dollar. That's our job for each of our clients. We will handle up to three accounts, up to $480 million only, not $481 million, not $488 million, $480 million. Not four accounts, not five, not two and a half accounts, three accounts. The price is on the website. Excuse me, I got to close this. All right. The price is on the website, ladies and gentlemen. The website address is on the first page of Stat.com. When you log in, excuse that, that was some extra research being done during the call when you log into SACCOM we're not going to go to this page just yet we're going to go to the main page and hopefully it'll take me there because the staple singers couldn't sing it enough when you log into SACCOM just so you'll know how to get here You're going to come down to the second block. Well, this is actually the block that I'm referring to as the second. You're going to click on the Debt Acknowledgement Program. Once you click on the Debt Acknowledgement Program, it's going to take you here. When you go here, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to read. It makes no sense if you don't take the time to read. Read, read. Not a lot of reading. Then after you read that, then you're going to read this section because you need to know what's going on and what's been going on with our laws. These are actual direct quotes from the law and the actual lawful understanding of the law. And after you get that understanding, then you can come here and you can take a look at the program. Make sure you read what's consistent in the program. Do not select 420 because you like the price. If you're not a current AMS, AMCF or Amerilegion client or a Fourth Amendment collateral acquisition secure client, program client, then you cannot qualify for this. You will be rejected and you will be prevented, prohibited from participating in this program.
permanently. Why? Because they've already had the majority of the work done here, they've already had done. We don't have to redo that. We only assign prices for the amount of work being done. Please understand. Because of catching up to all of the work that we needed to catch up with with all of our clients, I just spent $4,000 today in salary for just two people. So don't think that this is easy because there's a lot of paperwork, there's a lot of time, there's a lot of hours. And I'm not happy with having to spend that much in one go. But this is pay season. So I have to pay. Every worker is due their hire. What I am trying to tell you is I can't make it lower than what we've done. It is not possible. It is not possible. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the partnership program, I promise you, nobody's doing anything like this. Well, people are doing it. <laughs> Lawyers and uh, big, huge firms are doing it, but nobody is doing it the way we're doing it. That I guarantee you. And this is the honorary member debt relief program because they've already taken care of the notification of all parties and all of the challenging the debt. Well, we are now going to offset the debt, and we're going to document the offset. And we're going to have the official documentation of the offset. That's what we're getting ready to do. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're introducing the, let's get the title so that you can see it again, the Debt Acknowledgement Program. Okay? D-A-P. So the Debt Acknowledgement Program, everything about this program is explained here on this page from A to Z. Everything about the program is explained here on this page. And this is the only going to take you to this site right here, which is AMCF. No, this is the Merrill Legion. Why? Because the same information, in addition, will be found here on this page. That's why you see the section of joint resolution right here, the uniform value of coins and currencies of the United States. It's not HDR 192. That was the bill. This is the law. Been trying to tell that to people for years, and I keep mentioning it because you guys need to understand the courts have already come to the conclusion that if you mention HDR 192, they're going to ignore you because you're not quoting a law. Notice how we say dollar for dollar. Tax credits are dollars, people. So when you do it legally, the correct way, because there's a procedure for it, you can pay off your debt. Shh, don't tell anybody. That's what we're doing. All right, up to three accounts, up to three accounts. You won't be able to figure it out. You will be able to understand some aspects of the program when you receive certain paperwork. But the paperwork we're doing on the back end, there's a power of attorney that will be sent to you that you will need to limit it power of attorney. That power of attorney protects you and it protects us. Remember, there's an arbitration agreement. The arbitration agreement associated, give me a second, got to go all the way to the bottom, and this one, this is a long way down, so one second. The arbitration agreement, uh-oh, this one doesn't have the same footer, so give me a second. We're going to click on this. See that right there? Same arbitration agreement. This is our dispute policy. You got a dispute? That's what the arbitration agreement is for. That's why all of our contracts are limited power of attorney contracts. Why? So that we don't take advantage of you and you don't take advantage of us. It requires, watch this, I'm going to do control F and I want to do good faith. G, O, O, D. Ah, let's see. The arbitrator shall have exclusive jurisdiction to determine, render a decision, and or other compliance with respect to the good faith nature of this agreement. Ladies and gentlemen, this agreement has nothing to do with us taking advantage of you or you taking advantage of us. <sighs> Section 6E is intended to promote arbitral immunity. By definition, all suits against the arbitrator, arbitrating organization, or representatives of an arbitration organization arising out of the good faith discharge of the arbitral powers are frivolous. 
All the parties agree to that. The arbitrator will never rule in my favor just because I'm me. Arbitrators are not chosen for that reason, and if they did, they would be fired immediately, and I will definitely be the first one going to court. Arbitrators are not here under duress. Now, you're going to see, if you take a look at it, you're going to see that good faith thing all throughout. I want to go to the one previous, this one right here, and then I'm going to let you guys get on about your day. Watch this. Additionally, it is exurgent and of consequence that the undersigned to inform respondents in accordance with and pursuant with the principles and doctrines of clean hands and good faith that by the respondents fail your refusal to respond or provide the requested necessary proof of claims raised here and above and thereby and it shall be held and noted and agreed by all parties good faith is the issue here failure to respond in good faith that's all we're concerned with, is everybody acts in good faith. Fair hands, clean dealing. You give your word, we keep our word. Trust me, I am breaking my neck to make sure I keep my word at all times. It's not that I'm making sure I keep my word at all times because I got something to gain. It's I'm making sure I keep my word because it's what a man does. Okay? So, want you all to take a look at that. That is the agreement. That is the basis for us doing a limited power of attorney so that no one, let's say I'm not around. This is done so that nobody else is going to come in and take advantage of you. You guys already know about what Ron West did. Well, he's not the only one who tried to take advantage of people. So I'm not going to let that happen again. That's why this was put together. So that nobody can come in and change the structure of the organization. This is the house that Jack built. Jack ain't got no time for no remodeling. So this is permanent. This cannot be changed. This is an irrevocable agreement. And that's why the limited power of attorney references this agreement. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, as of today, this is October 1st, 2023. It is 1.48 p.m. Let me make sure you understand, not one single person in the last 30 years can come and say that I have defrauded them, taken anything from them, um, caused them to be in any anguish or distress as a result of their finances or their trust in me. Not a single person. That is my 30-year track record, and I dare anybody to show up and say that they can bring up a claim, because that would be a liar if they were to do so. My job is to operate under the title that I operate, and I can't say that title right now because I'm not supposed to bring that type of attention to his name, but I take that seriously. And so does the organization, because when I give my word, the organization is giving its word. If you would like to participate in the program, let's go back here so that you can see even after you've acquired the program, there's going to be individuals who's got questions. All of your questions are here. They're all answered throughout this whole page. Notice this. Have an issue? Please understand that we appreciate that. But we cannot answer all of your questions, as this is not the, that type of organization. Our form, this one right here, is for our client to communicate with us regarding specific issues that they are having after they've acquired the program. If you have a question regarding the program, you will need to read the information above and check the relevant updates on to this page as it will be updated periodically. We thank you in advance for your understanding. This requires if you do need, after you get the program, your name, your email address, the subject matter for which you wish to discuss your phone number, then there are right here, pay attention, three different things. Which program, because this is for previous clients, which program you're part of, and finally, the message. Because only the strong can survive. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us, and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity of being able to explain the program in more detail. Again, the site, the link, there you go. Have a good day, everyone, and we do appreciate you taking the time to take the time to listen about the new program, the Debt Acknowledgement Program. Have a good day.